oh God, we are a part of a story. A story that has gone on for, for thousands and thousands of years. A story that we retell every time we gather as your people. We may hear parts of the stories that we're not that familiar with or or parts of the story that we just don't know exactly how that fits into the life that we are called to be as your children. That's why we pray that you let the words of my mouth and the meditation of each heart here be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. Amen. So last week, as I started to prepare for uh, this sermon, and we're continuing in this study of, of the different covenants, uh, something crossed my mind, and it has to do with this Bible right here. This Bible was a Bible that was given to me uh, for my confirmation, and uh, my grandma gave it to me, and, uh, and I had to write in it because she went home, so I, I, my ugly scribbling is in this. You know, I got on the first day of June in uh, 1986, which reminds me, I'm not going to look over there, but I have a confirmation student that I was talking about when I was confirmed, and she went, oh my gosh, you were confirmed before my mom was born. <laughs> like, thanks. That's what I wanted to hear. It made me laugh. But one of the things about this Bible that, that, that's really special to me, you know, it, it, I mean, this is like a, a deluxe Bible. It has the indexes and everything, but it also has these awesome notes uh, that are at the bottom of each page. And I remember the first time that I opened up and I started to read out of Genesis 1. There's a, a nice little section that has, has these notes. And, and the first one it says the Edenic Covenant, about the covenant that God made with Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. And I started to read that, and I'm like, oh, this is really interesting. And then the next thing I notice, it, it kind of turns into a choose-your-own-adventure book, which um, what I mean by that, it says, now turn to page 7 and read about the Adamic Covenant. So I spent... I don't know how long I did. I spent there just following just a rabbit trail all the way through all the different covenants. You know, Abraham, Moses, David, you know, some of the covenants that we'll be talking about. We're not ending with the, the, the new covenant with, with Christ. And I guess that's one of the reasons why it really interests me and, and, and why we're doing this series is because, you know, the covenants are something that, that we know are there but we really don't know exactly what they're about. We, we, we know that they're a part of the story, but we, we wonder exactly how they are a part of our story. And, and if you remember a couple of weeks ago, whenever I uh, started out this series, I, I wanted us to remember that, that the main point or, or the main key about the covenants in the Bible is that they are all redemptive. Sometimes we like to play in our mind that, that the Old Testament God is, is this, this mean and horrible judge that is waiting to, to smite us and to kill us and, and to get rid of us. Or that we, we try to, to live up to what it is that God wants us to do and, and, and we fail miserably time and time again. But when we think about that, that allows God to be this, this distant figure that, that we may pay homage to here or there, but we don't really fully understand how he is a part of our story. The covenants are redemptive. From, from, from what happened with Noah to, to what we're going to talk about today with Abraham to, to Moses to David and even to the new covenant, every single one is all about restoring the original plan that God has for us. Restoring us back to what he started in creation in Genesis 1 and Genesis chapter 2. Letting us live in that new heaven and that new earth. I, I wanted to give kind of a, a, a little bit of an addendum, if I may, to uh, the sermon last week. I, I love because 
uh, one of the things that I love hearing other preachers or having the chance to do that is that you always miss stuff or, or, or you catch stuff maybe that you haven't heard before. And, and I pray that happens every single time we go into God's Word. Not, not that we're, we're missing things, but we're discovering something new in, in this text that, that, that we pour over time and time again. I, I loved how Pastor Frank talked about how the first words, or really the only words out of Noah, were words of a curse to his kid. You know, you, you don't really think about that. You know, you, you think about the, the pretty rainbow and you, you think about, you know, the animals and, and all that stuff or, or even how uh, the first thing that Noah did, he, he, he worshipped and he did all of that stuff. But, but the things that came out of his mouth was a, a curse against one of his kids. The thing that I, if I, if I were preaching that last week, which I guess I'm preaching on it right now, what I would add to that is that the, the, the covenant that Noah, that, that God attached with that bow, or we call it a rainbow now, but if you look at the Hebrew word, the word rain isn't a part of that word. It's just a bow that was stretched across the sky. Now, we look at the rainbow and we see that promise, but when we take a look at that bow, it is like that actual bow that was used to, to throw an arrow far, far, far away. And, and that bow is no longer or not placed and facing humanity. It's facing out, protecting humanity. Merida Klein, she put it this way, that the symbol of divine bellicosity and hostility has been transformed into a token of reconciliation between God and man. We see that a bow and arrow is used to either kill prey or, or way back then was used to, to fight an enemy. God has taken that bow and placed it over us to protect us, to let us know that we are in God's hands and God will never allow us to be harmed. That brings us to our second covenant. And that is the covenant that stretches nine chapters. I also love how Frank said that I gave him all these passages and he wasn't going to read them all. Well, I'm not going to read all nine chapters of, of uh, Abraham's story. I invite you to do that starting in uh, Genesis chapter 12 and, and forward. But I wanted to focus on one particular point of the story. And this particular point comes in Genesis chapter 15, verses 1 through 18. I invite you to follow along in your Bibles if you have them, or we'll have the words printed on the screens, and you can follow along there as well. Hear the word of the Lord. After this, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your very great reward. But Abram said, Sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless? And the one who will inherit my estate is Elzer of Damascus. And Abram said, You have given me no children, so a servant in my household will be my heir. Then the word of the Lord came to him, This man will not be your heir, but a son who is your own flesh and blood, will be your heir. He took him outside and said, Look up at the sky and count the stars, if indeed you can count them. Then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. Abram believed the Lord, and he credited to him as righteousness. He also said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chandelins to give you this land to take possession of it. But Abram said, Sovereign Lord, how can I know that I will gain possession of it? So the Lord said to him, Bring me a heifer, a goat, a ram, each three years old, along with a dove and a young pigeon. Abram brought all these to him, cut them in two, and arranged the halves opposite of each other. The birds, however, he did not cut in half. The birds of prey came down on the carcasses, but Abram drove them away. And as the sun was setting, Abram fell into a deep sleep, and a thick, dreadful darkness came over him. Then the Lord said to him, 
Know for certain that for 400 years your descendants will be strangers in a country not their own, and that they will be enslaved and mistreated there. But I will punish the nation they serve as slaves, and afterwards they will come out with great possessions. You, however, will go to your ancestors in peace and be buried at a good old age. In the fourth generation, your descendants will come back here, for the sin of the Amorites have not yet reached its full measure. And when the sun has set and darkness had fallen, a smoking fire pot with a blazing torch appeared and passed between the pieces. On the day the Lord made a covenant with Abram and said, To your descendants I give this land, from the wadi of Egypt to the great river, the Euphrates. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So if we were to take a look at where we are right now, the, the covenant that was established between Noah and God uh, established a, a people, a, a, a people that would come out of the ark. They, they would be fruitful and multiply. They would, they would control the, the vegetation and the plants, and they would grow to become God's people. But then something happens. If we move forward a little bit, but not quite to Genesis chapter 12, there's, there's a little section there in Genesis chapter 11. And you may be familiar with that section. That's the section where uh, the Tower of Babel is being built. And if you're familiar with that story, that a bunch of people gathered together, that they lived in this area, they said, hey, I have an idea. Why, why don't we make this like really, really huge tower that, that stretches all the way up to God so that people can see how great we are. Well, well God didn't think too highly of that, so he, he confused their language and, and he scattered the people. And then following that, we start hearing some of, of the, uh, the ancestral line from, Mos- from Noah all the way to Abraham. And that brings us to this guy living in a town called Ur, who has this, this, multi, money, uh, this polyistic uh, view of gods and everything. And he is there, and God comes and speaks to him. And, and the word that God gives to this guy, who's called Abram, is that he is to leave his hometown of Ur, and he is to travel and go all the way to this land that is promised to him. Now, this is a pretty treacherous trip. He, it, it's not just like he's going to, to, to Fort Worth from Roy City. He's going from a long, long ways, and, and a whole bunch of stuff happens with him on, the, on this trip. And, and if you look at it, it, it's just this crescent that, that Abram has to travel because that is the safest way to get from Ur all the way to the promised land or, or to the land that was promised to him. And, and as he goes, there are these struggles and there are these trials that, that Abram and Sarai go through as they are traveling together. Now we get to our passage today from Genesis chapter 15. Abram and Sarai have already been traveling for a while and, and they've had some things that have happened to them. And, and one of the things that has happened is that God had promised them this land, but also promised him that he would have a child. Now, the, the time of period that has kind of elapsed through here is probably about 50, 60 plus years from, from when Abram was called to go to this new settlement from this time that we have in our passage today. And God reminds him that he will be the one to have a great nation built upon him. I think one of the things that uh, amazes me about this passage is that, that there are four times from, from Genesis chapter 12 to the end of Abraham's story where God reminds him and tells him exactly what is going to happen. If you take a look right there at the beginning of Genesis chapter 12, it says that you are going to go to this land. And Abram says, okay, I'll go. That, that's all the detail he has. 
He is not given any more details, but Abram decides to go ahead and go. Bit by bit, through the passages, these nine chapters of the Bible, Abram has the story unfold more and more to him. So he knows that he will have an offspring and that the Lord who brought him out of Ur will help him to take possession of this land and their children will become numerous, more numerous than the stars and the skies that we could see. But all of this is contingent to a promise that God gives to Abram. And I believe God gives us that exact promise today. The very first verse of this passage, God calls to Abram and says, Do not be afraid, because I am your shield, your very great reward. Could God have been reminding Abram of the story of Noah? Reminding him about that, that bow that he has placed in the sky that would shield him, that would protect him as he went along his way. But if we're familiar with the story, we know that as we have done as times, as we maybe have held on to God's promise, we may get a little impatient. We, we may get a little weary that God's not moving quite the way that I want God to move. So I'm going to do something about that. How is God going to protect me when a king looks at my wife and says, boy, I think she would make a good addition to my harem. And I know that that king will probably kill me just to get me out of the way. Well, I'll, I'll just pretend like I'm, I'm her brother. That way everything will be okay and fine. If you're familiar with that story, the king realizes that he actually took Abraham's wife, the promise that, that God has for both of them, and, and releases them. Time and time again, Abram and Sarai fight what God has asked them to do. And each time, God reveals to them more and more of the promise that God has for them. Then we come to the promise, the sacrifice, or to the covenant. Now, this is a strange area because whenever, whenever you look at these last few verses, you wonder exactly what it is that, that God is pointing to here. He tells Abram to go and get you know, a, a heifer, a goat, a ram, a dove, and a pigeon. And, and if you're familiar a little bit with the sacrificial system that is set up later after the the uh, the the, temp, the covenant is set up with Moses, you can realize that these are the animals that are used for the sin offerings and for the burnt offerings. And not only are these the, the animals for the sin offerings or for the burnt offerings, but it covers the entire spectrum. For, for the heifer, that it was there for, for the king. The, the king, that way that sacrifice was made so the king's sins would be forgiven. It was all remembered all the way to the poorest of the poor who, who couldn't even afford to bring a lamb or, or a goat to have a bird there for the sacrifice. And, and God tells them that they cut the animals in two and, and, and place them apart from each other. And, and while he did that, Abram saw these birds coming in and trying to, and he's trying to protect this sacrifice or this offering to God. And then this darkness comes. This darkness that maybe Abram felt like that God wasn't there with him. But then God appears. And God appears in a way that, that we see him appear later in the Old Testament through, through smoke and through fire. And God alone passes through the sacrifice, the, the pieces of the animals that were cut side by side. And God does this for one specific reason and one specific reason only. It is a reminder that the promise and the sacrifice that is made doesn't really have anything to do with Abram, but it all has to do with God. 
God is saying by walking through this, these two cut pieces that the full responsibility of the covenant is going to be placed on me. Normally, the both sides would walk side by side down there saying, look, if you mess up, then you will have to pay back to me. But God is telling Abraham and also telling us that I will walk through alone because the responsibility of me giving you the promise inheritance that I've told you that you will receive is all on me. So, my friends, how do we respond? How, how do we respond to this, this second promise or, or to the second covenant that God has given us? Abram responded by a promise to, uh, to, uh, of circumcision. It's a sign where they would cut the males to, to let them know that they are making an oath to be beside God. But I think we are called to do that in a different way. John Wesley has a sermon called Circumcision of the Heart, which says that our gift, our promise, is to live our lives in holiness of heart and life. To, to live our lives in such a way that reminds that we continue to give ourselves to God who, who pours out his love on us, but we also take the opportunity to give ourselves to each other. That to live our lives in a community that reminds us of the community that God has already established before us. But every single time I look and read the story of Abraham, I see it as a part of my story. I, I see it how there are times in the midst where, where I know that God has told me that he is my shield and my very great reward, but I desire to find other ways to be protected. I, I desire to find other ways to receive a reward or something that can benefit me or something that can, can make me greater than maybe I should be. I, I, I look for ways to make sure that I am lifted up instead of God being the one who is lifted up in my life. Another way that I look at that is that when God calls us, he calls us from a status of doubt to belief. He calls us from ways that we may doubt what God has for us to fully believe, because that's what Abram did. We, we hear that promise in Genesis chapter 15, verse 6, where God created it to Abram. His belief about the covenant and the promise that God was going to give to him as righteous. And it's so important that it is repeated later in Romans chapter 4, verses 18 through 23. And Paul writes to remind us that, look, at all of this stuff that Abram had to do, uh, how he had to leave his home and, and went to a place that wasn't officially his, but God gave it to him. And he did it. He did it on his own, knowing that God would guide him and lead him and protected him. And the Lord credited to him as righteous. So as we hear this second covenant, knowing that God protects us from, from, from disasters around us, how will we live our lives with God as our shield and God as our very great reward? Let us pray. Oh God, you have promised us your faithful love. And Lord, we know that your faithful love never fails. Your faithful love is always there for us. And sometimes we, we fail to take the opportunity to see it. We, take, we fail to take the opportunity to hear it. But Lord, I pray that you give us the faith that Abraham had to move forward boldly knowing that you are our shield and you are our great reward. Help us to, to use that as a way to love one another, to move boldly in ministry, to move boldly in our relationships with you and with one another. Allow that holiness to fill us 
so that we may proclaim you and so that we may live in your love. And we pray this in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.